What's up, everybody? Welcome to News, Games, and More, IGN's daily live news show. I'm Damon Hatfield. I'm your host today. Today, I'm joined by, let's see who I'm joined by, Brian Altano. Hello, hello, hello. Seth Macy is out there. Yeah, hello, I am out here. Out there in the great state of Maine. And Jonathan Dornbush is joining you us. For- from- you forgot who we were, didn't you? No, not at all. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm, kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. And I can't see you up there, it's like... Who's on the show again today? I get it. I totally could be anybody, really. I mean, we could have swapped out the rectangles at the last second. It's been a weird year, (laughs) folks. Mm. Yeah, it's been a weird year. At least it's about half over. In in two days, in two days, it'll be half over. All right. So there's that. We did uh, it, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> We're halfway through the pain. <laughs> like a half birthday. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Uh, that means uh, we're going to be talking about some uh, PlayStation. Actually, we're, gonna, we're covering all of our bases this week or uh, today. We're covering PlayStation, Xbox, and Nintendo news all on the same show. It's going to be great. Uh, but first, I want to let you know there will not be a show tomorrow because we're airing uh, the awards ceremony for IGN's Summer of Gaming during the same time. So please be excited for that. There will be a special guest, I am told. Stay tuned to find out who that is. Hold on, hold on. D- yes. Damon, do you have do yep. you have an do you have an animated hat that says NG Plus? Yes, I oh do. My God. <laughs> <laughs> How did you more like you? more like Cyberpunk twenty twenty? What? <laughs> I can wow. make this. I can make this say whatever I want to, Brian. I bet you can. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. I didn't even know we had that kind of technology. This I mean, I did. Proof. It's just <laughs> this is proof that Instagram ads work. <laughs> it, yeah, it, it's it's working on me. That's excellent work. Yeah, it's actually I've been wearing this on GameScoop, and uh, some of the listeners have like commented about it, and now they've said that an ad for this hat has started showing up in their timeline. So, oh weird. That's, yeah, that's how that's how you should get a is. cut. Yeah, that's, I should get a cut. <laughs> um, ladies and gentlemen, let's begin with PlayStation. <laughs> As June comes to an end, that can only mean one thing: it's time to announce the games you're getting with PlayStation Plus in July. Those games are NBA 2K20, Rise of the Tomb Raider, 20-Year Celebration Edition, and Erica. I'm actually not... I'm going to guess Erica is some kind of uh, visual novel. You're Mm. not... You're not far off. Okay, uh, they okay. released it during uh, Gamescom opening night live last year, oh, wow. uh, and it it's or right after that. It's basically a full motion video, like it, it's filmed like a film, and you play it via an app on your phone to make the choices. Um, so you use a companion app to basically choose where the story goes by picking dialogue or like zooming in on things or, or uh, opening uh, locks and things like that. It's uh, like a movie, but this time you're the director. <laughs> <laughs> basically, yeah. It's basically it's Night Trap 2.0. Yeah. yeah, they actually they do a lot of research at PlayStation, and they were trying to figure out what the number one game would be to sort of accompany uh, NBA, and mm-hmm. they picked this one. So this mm-hmm. is they go hand in hand. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah, they really do. Oh. Um, NBA is a, <laughs> a known quantity, of course. Rise of the Tomb Raider is a really good game. Yeah, yeah. it is a great game. Best um, of the trilogy, in my opinion. Interesting. Actually, oh, that's interesting. I think, uh, Brian, we were just talking about uh, what a good game Rise of the Tomb Raider is. Yes, it completely kicks ass. Um, if you're looking for... It, it, weird how those those games worked out, because they're sort of like Uncharted borrowed from Tomb Raider and then Tomb Raider borrowed from Uncharted again. Um, yeah, yeah I, re- I really, really like that game. Um, John- like Jonathan it, just said he thinks it's his favorite of the trilogy. Oh, yeah, I think so, too. Huh. That's interesting. I think, so too. I think I have to go with the original uh, for the um, the Die Hard rule, uh, and that it's I, I just like that it's more a little bit more self contained to the island. Mm. Right. It's not it's not as much a globe trotting adventure. Yeah. That's fair. Yeah. It, it's like the Arkham Asylum versus Arkham City debate sort of thing. Exactly. I exactly. Yeah. I prefer Asylum. I know I'm in the does minority. She, does she battle any uh, dinosaurs in the new trilogy? No, no she hasn't. Sadly. Spoilers. There is some- yeah. <laughs> no dinosaurs. Uh, there is some uh, supernatural-ish elements that sort of weaves its way into all of these games. Um, yeah. And some of them are, I would say, borderline ridiculous, but no sure. dinosaurs. Um, dinosaurs weren't supernatural. Those were real uh, lizard <laughs> creatures that used to roam the earth. Depends I've never on, seen one. I guess, depends on who you vote for. And, like, you know, <laughs> there's a lot of, a lot of different... 
a lot of debates out there. <laughs> they were put there to test us. That's true. And to be ridden. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the test. Can you last eight seconds? <laughs> um, Rip yeah, me, think- Perry. The... Uh, yeah, rip indeed. Uh, the this modern trilogy gets a little bit more supernatural as it goes on, and uh, I won't you know spoil anything. But at, by the end of Shadow of the Tomb Raider, Lara has kind of gained some powers, even. Oh wow, yeah, that's really? right. Wow. Yeah, yeah. That um, Shadow of the Tomb Raider. I think we're debating over which is the best one. I think we can all agree that that is the the least good of the three, <laughs> but also um, still fun. Still, still fun, yeah. yeah. Still a really fun still game. Yeah, yeah, weirdly, like, sort of forgettable game, but um, I actually really like the stuff in the second one that um, w- the sort of open-ish environments that let you just kind of mm. hunt and, and fight dudes and level up and, and all that. Uh, I really dug that because that, that's something I think is always missing from the Uncharted games. Yeah. Uncharted 4 had a, a couple of big open areas, but they didn't really uh, do it for me because there wasn't really a lot going on. Yeah. Um, and then I think the 20 year celebration edition of Rise of the Tomb Raider has all the extra content and the uh, the the retro skin for Lara, where she you can you can play the entire game where she looks like she's oh, yeah. from the PlayStation One original in all of her polygonal oh, cool. glory. Yeah. yeah, it is very cool. Seth, yeah, have you but... not played these games? No, I played the first one and okay. I really liked it, and then I just never played any more of them. I don't know well, what's my problem. Well, you're out of excuses now. I've been playing NBA Two K since uh, <laughs> like 2012, though. Oh, and I'm still Quite terrible like, at it. Every, every new year, you play the new the new version. Yeah, I haven't. I didn't play it this year, so this is exciting because I knew if you, I just if I just held on, what this a month! Would be my what my a month summertime you, PlayStation three <laughs> game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And plus, there's no real basketball, or I guess that's not true. It's coming back, but perfectly timed yeah. there. PlayStation yeah. people are, are got basketball fever. Got a basketball Jones. I think this is a pretty strong month for PlayStation Plus. Yeah, I would agree with you. Um, I I would probably uh, want to play Rise of the Tomb Raider again if if it not were for other recent releases that I'm playing like The Last of Us Part Two. Yep. Yeah. If it if it wasn't already a crazy time for games <laughs> at the moment, Rise yeah. would be a great game to have right now. But I will go ahead and claim it, and then probably never download it. Like hey, I did. But... You know, there's a there's a deal on PlayStation Plus. If you go check out our daily deals, you can use a code, an IGN specific code, and you get it for like thirty five bucks or something for a year. It's actually like a really legitimately excellent deal. Seth is the king of deals. He's the deals guy. That's right. He's he's the deals dad. No, no, I'm part of a deals team. Okay, I can't okay. take all the credit. <laughs> Got it. Um, apparently, PlayStation Plus has just turned ten years old. I was not aware of this this anniversary event. Jonathan, were you aware this is happening? Uh, yeah, I was aware starting about a week ago that it was the 10th anniversary. <laughs> um, PlayStation Plus has kind of fallen by the wayside, it feels like, in PlayStation's focus. Hmm. Um, so for me, PS Plus has become less of a big deal every month. Like, I really used to look forward every month to the big new game reveals, and now it's kind of like a, oh yeah, they announced those, maybe I'll be interested. Um but uh, I, I did not realize it had been around that long. It totally makes sense. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a strange time, in my opinion, for PS Plus. Yes, like uh, many things that have gotten old over time, their value has waned, and so has their power. <laughs> uh, it, it feels like something that um, we, we, we forget that we pay for, and then we have to pay for because it, it paywalls certain things, like cloud saves. Um, and, and then every now and then... Yeah, multiplayer. and a multiplayer. And every now and then you get a, a, a basketball game or or a, a film that you can play, such as Erica. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's definitely like the we. I mean, over on Podcast Beyond, Jonathan and I are always talking about how we wish that this had the last year had been a great opportunity for them to start throwing in uh, PSVR games and sort of like making the value a little bit better. It feels like they drop the games regularly from like four or five games a month across three different platforms to two mm-hmm. games a month on one platform uh, this month. Yeah. Obviously, they're giving you three, so things are looking better. And to be fair, this, that's, this is a very big month, so this is a weird month to complain about it. Um, but in general, it does feel like the value of the service has declined a bit. Uh, yeah. The price has remained the same. 
it, it used to be six games per month, uh, two on primarily PS3, two on Vita, and two on PS4, and then they shrunk it down to only a guaranteed two games, and like you were saying, there's a third game this month, but it's very rare. But they didn't supplement that loss of six games with anything additional. Um, I think they upgraded like the amount of cloud save data, but that's not really like a comparable why you bought the service to begin with sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, like Brian was saying, I think, PSVR would have been the smartest move because if it's actually a thing they believe in, like Damon, you were saying, you claim a game and then never maybe play it, but let's say yeah. you didn't buy PSVR and then have 20 free claimed games, maybe mm-hmm. you're more inclined to buy PSVR down the road. Right. So, um, so yeah. Well, so do you think they that Sony should like reevaluate PlayStation Plus going into the PlayStation 5 generation? I mean, oh, absolutely. They, yeah. yeah, they should. Will they? I mean, from a business perspective, they're crushing it. Uh, the, what, Jonathan, what were the stats on how many, what, what, is it two or three out of five PlayStation 4 owners are PlayStation I think Plus it's, subscribers? Yeah, I think it's somewhere in the 30 to 40 million range out of 100 million or so. So yeah, yeah it's it's a, a decent chunk, but not, you know, all of the players. Uh, mm-hmm. So like to your point, Damon, I don't think they'll improve the value of it until they're forced to. Uh, Mm -hmm. kind of like what we saw with Xbox this generation where they made really great value out of something like Game Pass because they kind of needed a reason to get people to come to the Xbox ecosystem and that was a smart move. But Sony is as operating at like the market leader probably doesn't feel like they need to unfortunately add value until they're put in a place where they need to add value to get customers back. Hmm. Well, we should be going back to getting... uh playstation plus games for multiple platforms once the ps5 is launched i would assume oh yeah, oh, Hopefully. yeah. i actually <laughs> didn't even think about that i yeah. mean yeah I, w- I mean what did, did we get we got free games month one on ps4 right you got resogun I, that's yeah. Right. right oh yeah okay yeah so. i i genuinely don't know if they will though just because we don't know what the lineups are going to look like i i mm-hmm. hope they are like i hope yeah. there are PS5 games, but I wouldn't be shocked if they're like starting in 2021, you will be getting PS5 games uh, on PS Plus just to let the library uh, get a little larger. Um, Ooh, calling it now. Yeah. NBA 2K22. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You'll get that it. in 2023. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Sony revealed the top five uh, games that have been revealed uh, via or uh, that have been redeemed via PS Plus globally. They are Call of Duty Modern Warfare, Sonic Forces, Shadow of the Colossus, Call of Duty Black Ops 3, and Destiny 2. So all just big, gigantic games for the most part. Um, The Shadow of the Colossus thing makes me happy because I I think that that's like... uh, People playing that for the first time is... Man, they're in for a treat. Um, Not surprised to see two out of five Call of Duties up there. The the series that everyone (laughs) hates... Until it time, right. comes yeah. time to open up the wallet. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Sonic Forces surprises me. That's, that's a more a recent one, yeah. free one. And there have been so many big games like Bloodborne and Ratchet were free in the same month uh, a year or two ago. Hmm. Uh, I would think PS exclusives like that would be some of the biggest ones. But I guess the timing hit and people were hungry for a Sonic game and it was free. So they downloaded Sonic Forces. The perfect price. <laughs> Wasn't... Um, wasn't Rocket League a PlayStation Plus game? Am I crazy? Probably Ooh, I think originally, yeah. 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 It, it I feel like originally it was, a, right? I, I mean, that's part of why like I miss the days when PS Plus mattered so much more because it was that debuted as a free game, and I think a lot of Rocket League's big uh, breakout success was because of that, um, mm-hmm. and because so many people just immediately jumped into that game. Uh, whereas we don't really have those moments anymore. Like PS Plus isn't a place where I think discoveries like that happen because there's now only two games, so they don't tend to risk putting a brand new game uh, or a smaller game on there as often because. Mm-hmm. You know, there's so few spots. Mm-hmm. So here's a question for you guys. What's the best game that you've ever redeemed via PlayStation Plus and sort of discovered that way? Like, don't count something like Rise of the Tomb Raider that you've already played and downloaded again. What's something that you redeemed and then played for the first time and thought was amazing? Ooh. Man, I mean, Rezo Gun's a really good a really good one. That's um, a great game, yeah. Bloodborne's the yeah. cheating answer, but I had already put like 100 hours into that game. It mm-hmm. just made me happy when they put that out there because uh, people were able, able to get on my level for a couple of weeks and understand <laughs> why I have such brain damage about that game. 
but yeah, it's probably it's probably Resogun. I'd have to look at the list. Let me see if I can pull one up. Yeah, I found a wiki and I'm looking because I, I really don't. <laughs> it's been so long since I think I've played something specifically from PlayStation mm. Plus, which I mean, I guess speaks to obviously we're in a, a much more privileged position where, you know, we get games for review or yeah. office copies that we share. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm looking back at the list. I'm trying to think. I bought a secondhand PlayStation 3 long enough back when you'd still get free games. I think it was Yakuza 5. Oh, that was one of them. Mm. That's a and I had never played a Yakuza game. And uh, I would like to spend more time with that series because that's uh, that's right up my alley. You're in luck. There's new Yakuza games coming out all the time. Oh, <laughs> uh, my, for my pick, I'd have to say Spelunky. Spelunky is oh yeah, probably one of the greatest oh, games ever made. Yeah. It was just given out for free on PlayStation Plus. Mm-hmm. I could I like, and I've spent so many hours, like hundreds of hours, playing this game. I almost feel bad that I didn't actually like pay the, <laughs> the developer money for it. But if Spelunky Two is ever finished. I will happily, happily purchase that game. Uh, I, I will say one. It's not, I, I don't think it's like the best game I've played from PlayStation Plus, but I don't think I would have played it had it not been. And it's called That's You, which is a sort of PlayStation specific uh, Jackbox game, basically. Oh, uh, sure. And it's it's not the best paced party game. Uh, it has a little bit too much uh, of those interstitials where someone's making jokes at you while they explain how the game works. But I think it's a really fun party game, uh, especially when you have the right group of friends playing together. And it's uh, there's a lot of fun, ways that you can mess with each other as you're playing because it's really dependent on the group knowing one another uh mm. and so I, I do think it's a really really fun party game that i i actually wish they had made a sequel to because i think they could have done a lot to improve on it but it was a really good like base formula interesting it's only on playstation this yeah it's game? part it's part of so it's not a jackbox game it's just okay. jackbox like um okay. but it's from the it's like their PlayLink games that use mobile apps uh to play Mm-hmm. Uh, um, it's one of those games. Mike Drucker wrote for that game. Oh, nice. Yeah. yeah, like it's it's not that the writing's bad. It's just that they put too much in between each thing. So mm-hmm. like you're waiting with a group of five people to play and it's like two minutes of all of you being quiet as you listen. <laughs> Expositional uh, dialogue. Yeah, there's just a little too much exposition, <laughs> but it's it, it's well made and it's a funny game. It's, I yeah, so it. if if you don't like it, just tweet at Mike Drucker and tell him that it's it's bad and the writing is it really <laughs> let you down and that just he's, do that, yeah. and that he's garbage. You can t- t- <laughs> yeah. and tell him I sent you (laughs) mike drucker uh wrote one of the funniest tweets i've ever read and i still think about it from time to time and it was during um a game awards show when you're seeing a lot of trailers and i'm going to paraphrase his joke tweet uh right now that still makes me laugh to this day uh it goes something like uh the announcer says uh explore a vast underground dungeon yes Battle gigantic monsters. Yes. Join up with your friends online. I'm out. <laughs> I think about that all the time. That's like the truest, the truest. I, I, I felt I felt seen when he, I, when he did I, I texted him the other day because he had me crying laughing because there, there was this video going around of one of those theater chains like hosing down the seats. <laughs> and he was like, is this a commercial for Netflix? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, okay, so happy 10th birthday, PlayStation Plus. I guess you could uh, you could go to Chuck E. Cheese if uh, they weren't all going <laughs> if they weren't all going out of business. You know their bank growing their parent company uh, filed for bankruptcy. Yeah, do you know yes. why? It's because it's hard to social distance when your cast is bolted to the floor. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I think it would be sad. Don't you think it would be sad, Brian, if our kids don't ever get to go to Chuck E. Cheese? I uh. I think it's yes, I never sad. went to one. I'm <laughs> I'll tell you slight, what. Slight what, yes. I mean, I have. One of my, I literally have a Chuck E. Cheese right here. <laughs> yeah. One of my like, favorite main moments of all time was at the Portland Chuck E. Cheese. Rest in peace. It's not there anymore. We were there at eleven o'clock in the morning. There was a couple having a. There was a birthday party, and one of the adults leaned over to the other one and said, "Can you believe there's a two beer maximum?" <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. My uh, yeah. Oh yeah. My favorite Chuck E. Cheese moment ever. Uh, I love that we put like an Xbox in the thumbnail <laughs> 20 minutes into the show. We're getting there, I promise you. Um, no, we, we were at a birthday party and my cousin, who was like 13 at the time, walked up to Chuck E. Cheese or the man in the costume of Chuck E. Cheese and 
just punched him so hard <laughs> that his head spun around backwards <laughs> like like Daffy Duck. <laughs> oh man. Yeah, I hope... that's why that's why there's a two beer maximum. <laughs> <laughs> it was called um uh, it was called Showbiz Pizza in Kansas City where I grew up. Um okay, uh Rocker Fire Explosion? Yeah, exactly. Jonathan, I know you have some uh, interview pieces uh, for The Last of Us Part Two that went up today, but is it possible to talk about them without spoiling anything? Uh, I mean, I get pretty deep into the Superman cameo uh, oh, well, great. for a while. So, there we go. Yeah, now we probably, have to edit that part out. Yeah, pr- of this, edit this out of this live show. Um, <laughs> Fans no... were furious, too, because he's a girl now. <laughs> <laughs> Um, probably not. I will just say if you've beaten the game, you can definitely read both. Uh, if you haven't, I wouldn't read either, but, uh, I spoke with Neil Druckmann, uh, a little bit about basically earlier versions, like the in development process of the game and how it used to actually be a, a much more open world game that had you in the Jackson location, which is a you know known location for a much longer time. And it worked a little bit differently. And the way that mm. certain characters were introduced and fell into the story played out much differently than how it does in the final game. Uh, so it's, it's really interesting to hear from him sort of about why these changes were made and how the changes came about. But uh, if you haven't beaten the game, I would recommend not reading those stories just yet. Gotcha. Brian, have you beaten this game? Yes, I have. Um, I want to say it's in my top five of the generation. Hmm. I really, really, really liked it. Um, yeah. There's. I understand why there are certain things and certain decisions that people aren't happy about. Um, I also find the conversations about those decisions to be fascinating and interesting and wonderful, um, like, a, like great movies. Uh, I, I've seen a lot of people say that... Um, you know, like the it's the gameplay is good, but the the cutscenes are are you know blah 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 blah. Um, I think that like this game specifically separates itself from uh, from movies because there are conflicts that happen that are player controlled that um, play out emotionally in a different way than they would if you were just watching them happen on a television. Mm-hmm. And so I appreciate that. I think um, I don't want to get into anything too like artsy, like it's a medium defining blah, 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 blah. But um, I, I do really feel like that there's, we are, we are inching closer and closer to an era where storytelling that happens in video games will really truly find its footing differently in, than, than books and movies uh, and television in that um, I think that there are emotions that are able to be conveyed in player controlled segments that don't happen when you're watching a film. And I appreciate it for that. It's also, it's, it's hard to compare it to a film. Cause I would say it's, it's, it feels more like a couple of seasons of a TV show. Like mm-hmm. this is, this would have been a, a like a woefully condensed film. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. Like even as a trilogy of movies, I think that like there's 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 a lot of I mean, it's like it took me like 25, 30 hours to beat this game. So there's a lot going on um, right now. It's my favorite game of the year easily um, and probably one of my favorite games of the generation. And that's coming from someone who didn't really ever think we needed this game. I kind of like winced when they first announced this game because I was like, why? Like, why? Why would you revisit that? You had you told such a perfectly contained story the first time around and like it feels like a cheap like cash grab marketing ploy to go back in here and i and now i'm i'm enamored with what they did with it i can't wait to see where this goes next if this is the sort of empire strikes back of the trilogy then hmm. you know return of the jedi is my favorite star wars movie even though it's pretty dumb um so i'm excited <laughs> to see what happens from here uh or if it just ends from here i'm, I'm happy with that too so uh well, i'm still playing it um i'm in seattle it's hard to like it's hard to talk about specifics without spoiling things because i feel like those big important story beats are sort of what uh uh communicates like where you are in the whole thing so anyway i'm, I'm a few hours into it i'm i'm really enjoying it a lot looking forward to playing it every night mm-hmm. um seth have you started it nah video games are for nerds i don't yeah i ride my motorcycle i don't mess with that yeah that kind of stuff check out no, I, gone. Uh, <laughs> I i think i've come around i I never really got into the original The Last of Us, and it makes everybody mad. And, they, and I have a reputation as somebody who hates it, which isn't fair because I just never got into it. Sure. But uh, 
I've been watching like videos of people have been posting of gameplay and it's kind of extremely intriguing to me now mm -hmm. because when we first saw this at like 2018 E3 of like the, the fighting and stuff, I thought, well, this is this is baloney. This this isn't real. Like this is a, a pre-animated thing and they're saying it's gameplay, but it won't be like this. But now I see it playing out. And I'm like, oh, OK, no, this is real. Like this looks incredibly good from a gameplay perspective. And that actually has me very interested in uh in giving in giving in to my uh yeah my hatred of this game that everybody thinks that i that i hate that's not true i don't hate the last of us no unfortunately i think it. that that that's that's a weird part of the conversation here that's sort of fallen by the wayside um this game is an awesome game to play like I think a lot of people have forgotten that. Like the gameplay in this game is phenomenal, mm -hmm. um, especially when you bump up the difficulty a little bit and play it a little stealthier with um, more melee weapons and shanks and shivs and axes and all that fun stuff. Like sneaking around this game, it, this is top tier stealth, top tier horror. Like this, the gameplay is excellent in this game. Like yeah, yes, that, that's what, yeah. Well, that's why I didn't. I didn't like the gameplay of the first one enough to want to keep playing it to like see the story like i just didn't like throwing bottles and trying to sneak past a guy or like getting me like oh there's a crate here and a ladder what do you think we should do yeah so, uh... I, I feel like they toned a lot of that down significantly in this game um you can still throw bricks and bottles and stuff but i didn't find myself doing that i, I think the thing about yeah. this game that thrives is that there's a there's you have a lot more sort of like there's a there's a, a bigger sandbox in terms of what you can play with um, at, at your repertoire, so you don't really necessarily feel shoehorned into specific styles as much. Oh, man. Yeah, the, uh, the the balance between stealth and like all out action that you can really have go on within a single scenario, I think, is so mm -hmm. great with this game because it it allows for a lot of planning, but also a lot of improvisation that doesn't feel like all of it feels justified and um like a good plan or like a good uh course of action to take no matter the scenario and i really appreciate the flexibility and all of that it actually made me really bummed out that there isn't a multiplayer mode in this game because i think the last of us one's multiplayer is actually really underrated and um i it, with all of the new additions they made for the sequel i think we could have had such a cool multiplayer mode so i hope they explore that in the future on ps5 yeah i'm really enjoying it looking forward to playing more tonight uh, the past couple of weeks, every night has played out the exact same way. We put the kid to bed, we watch a couple episodes of Money Heist, and then I play a couple hours of Last of Us Part 2. If anyone isn't watching Money Heist, I recommend it. Uh, Jonathan, you also put up an article on Crash Bandicoot 4 today. I, I did. I've been busy. Um, yeah, we put up a little bit more Crash Bandicoot 4 gameplay today, uh, exclusive that we put up on IGN. You can check it out on the website or on YouTube. Uh, basically, it's a look at, we have uh, chunks of the pirate-themed level that was first teased in some of the early uh, reveal trailer, but we show sort of the beginning, middle, and end of it, and I kind of break down everything that happens. Uh, if you're watching and you've already watched the video, some people did not get it. I was just joking about the shark crate in there. <laughs> Uh, if you've watched the video, you'll understand. Uh, it was just a joke, I promise. Um, but yeah, they, they show off some of the new uh, crates that are in the game, some of Crash's new moves, some of the new enemy variety and animation. I think it's just a really great look at like the fidelity with which they're trying to approach classic Crash levels, but mm -hmm. on modern hardware. Are you excited for this game, Jonathan? No, not at all. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm kind of, no, I can't wait. Uh, I, I love the original crash trilogy are some of my most played platformers of all time. Uh, and every crash game since then really hasn't lived up to that original trilogy. Uh, and I think toys for Bob, the developers did such a great job with the Spyro remake trilogy that I, I have a lot of hope that they as crash and Spyro and platforming fans in general will do it justice. Hmm. Brian, where do you come down on crash? Um, I always thought it was like the, uh, like super mario for kids who whose parents were fighting <laughs> like, <laughs> like i i i i grew to love the games but when i was when i was younger and this first came out it it totally felt like um a cash grab for a, a mascot platformer mm -hmm. um but where this one is heading like i'm totally into this this looks way more like sort of nintendo seal of quality than um, mm -hmm. the remastered versions, which I think were like, if you grew up with those games, those were really serviceable and awesome. But um, in terms of like being able to hold its own against something like Super Mario Odyssey or 
Um, yeah. Really, most other 3D platformers, it wasn't even coming close. But this looks phenomenal. I'm super into this. So what's the difference for you? Um, I think the art direction is a lot more sort of cohesive this time around. It's gorgeous. It doesn't look like uh, the gameplay is relegated to just that sort of simple run towards the camera, although there's a lot of that. Um, it just looks more varied. It looks like the, the level design is more fun. As you can see, there's like these 2D segments. Um, this feels straight up Super Mario Odyssey mm -hmm. uh, 2 to me. Like there's, there's a lot of really cool stuff in here that just looks like a really fun platformer. Um, and I think it's also not necessarily held back by its roots as much because it's not a remaster. It's a brand new game. Mm -hmm. And so I think that they're going to be able to pull off a lot of cool stuff. It is cool that we're getting uh, a, a proper sequel to a series that we that it's been dormant for like, what twenty years. Yeah, yeah, that's nuts. Like, I mean, if I, you think about it, I think it, it was probably they they did the legwork on doing the remastered graphics and everything, and then they were yeah. like, you know, what do we do with all this? Like, we have all these ingredients in the fridge. Let's cook. <laughs> uh, Seth, you a crash man? I I am not a crash man. I was uh, kind of like Brian, where I I was too old i think when this game came out i think i was like 34 when this came out the original playstation <laughs> yeah. one okay game. i was definitely but... <laughs> not 34 when this came out <laughs> give me some credit no, i was i was not either but i um i don't know for whatever reason it just never appealed to me but then you know i see how much people really love it and then this yeah. new one does look really cool and i'm willing to to give it a chance yeah, for sure. No, I, I think that like one of the things that I've gotten much better at as I get older and I urge many gamers to do the same is to not uh, sort of just like in, in, inherently dunk on something that is that you missed growing up mm -hmm, or yeah. that uh, people are really excited for. Like I, I look at some I look at stuff like this and I'm like, why do people like it? And then I, I kind of pay attention and I go, OK, I see what they're going for. I'm interested in trying this myself, even though I didn't I grew up more of a Nintendo you know, Mario, even Banjo Kazooie, Conquer type of dude. Mm -hmm. um, the old rareware uh, platformers, obviously. But there's a lot of cool stuff here, and I can't wait to play it. Yeah, that's coming out this fall. Jonathan, do you have that release date? October of 2nd. October yeah. 2nd. Um, and it will be coming, even though it was a former uh, PlayStation exclusive, coming to Xbox One. Not coming to Nintendo Switch, at least not. At launch uh, with the other consoles. Yes. It probably will at some point. That was yeah. the the end Sane trilogy only uh, debuted on PS4, and then it right. came to all of their platforms like a year later. Right, exactly. Yeah, I, I mean, checking the eShop stuff when, when Crash came out, that was like regularly in the top of the charts for a while, so they would be missing yeah. out on a lot of money to not get there as soon as possible. <laughs> okay, now we will talk about Xbox. Uh, of course, <laughs> Xbox Series X is a flagship next-generation console for Microsoft coming out this holiday. There's long been a rumor that they have um, a, a second model of their next console that's less powerful and uh, more affordably priced. It's been uh, used the codename Xbox Lockhart. Sometimes we also call it the Xbox Series S. A new report claims that it will be revealed in August after uh, being originally scheduled for an announcement during E3. This comes from Eurogamer. Uh, apparently, according to Eurogamer sources, they were, wanted to have it at E3 next to the Series X, showing them both playing the same games. Uh, now that reveal will apparently come in August, uh, and this is uh, corroborated by a, a Venture Beat report. So it's looking more and more like uh, the Xbox Series S or Lockhart is a real thing. There was also a discovery of Windows OS code that references the Lockhart code name. So Jonathan, how are you feeling about the sort of uh, uh, possibility that there is the second model of the next Xbox? Oh, it, it, it feels like just an almost certainty, like a 99.9% .9 certainty unless Phil Spencer decides to change his mind last minute. Um, I, I do think we're going to get this. I do think, uh, especially as we've seen with this generation, uh, especially Xbox, but both Xbox and PlayStation, like having different tiers of consoles and different availabilities of consoles, and especially with Microsoft's really big focus of wanting you to get into the micro Microsoft ecosystem regardless of where you're playing. They just want you on Xbox. I think it makes total sense that they have a cheaper entry point console. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Brian, what do you think about all this? Um, I think it's fascinating because if you look at the sort of Apple approach, it's rare that um, there's such a spread or such a divide between um, 
multiple SKUs being announced at once. Usually they get those all in the same place, but also Apple pretty much puts all of their information front and center day and date where they go, this is when you can buy this. This is how much it costs. Uh, the next gen console wars this year have been bizarre in that we don't have definitive release dates, prices, uh, really anything outside of like some visual identity of what the boxes look like so far. So it will be sort of interesting. Microsoft is juggling a bit more than Sony in that regard because they can't just come out and go, you know, this is what the Series X costs. And then a month or two later go, here's what this is. I think they have to announce, like they're going to have to announce prices for both of those things on the same day. It'll be really mm -hmm. weird if they just show the new box, which, you know, from the rumors, it seems kind of gamecube -y. I, I kind of dig it. Yeah. Um, there's a very sort of visual representation of its um, lack of power compared to the Series X, if only based on how tall they are, which is how <laughs> my simpleton brain registers <laughs> power levels. Um, <laughs> and so we'll see how that goes. But I, I do think it's interesting because they will be able to technically say, hey, you can get a seat at the next gen console table for what I presume will be much, much cheaper than the Series X and uh, the PlayStation 5. And so that's a good in, but I do wonder if this thing's going to be sort of debilitated from the jump and how well it'll hold up in the long term. Like it's one of those things where you can you can buy it like a you know cheap ass cookware and it will save you money today, but fall apart in a year. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas if you put money into something a little bit nicer, you'll have it for a lifetime. Video games are different than that because they don't necessarily fall apart right away and they don't last a lifetime. But I do think that if you end up spending a little more early on, you'll have a long tail sort of more future proof version of this console. Um, but then if you're just getting something for Game Pass, then maybe it's the way to go. And yeah. if I like from a Microsoft standpoint of the you know, buy something cheaper and maybe it doesn't last as long, if you buy into the ecosystem and then you're locked in, you're like, oh, I love Game Pass. I love these games I have. I don't want to lose access. Then you buy a Series X and then they got you for two consoles. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, the, the Series S makes a lot of sense from what their bet is for the next generation. Uh, so I'm, I'm not surprised whatever they end up doing with this on that lower price point sort of tier. Mm -hmm. I guess... I guess what's really interesting to me is like if it's it's less powerful than the Series X, but where does it land? Is it more powerful than the Xbox One? Is it more powerful than the Xbox One X? It, I, it bare it'll, minimum, thinking, it has to be. Yeah, yeah, it'll be more. It'll be better than a One X. But yeah, I I think it will be sort of like on a power tier level One X, and then you'll have the Series S or whatever it's called, and <laughs> yeah. then PS5 and then Series X. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the one whatever this is going to be is going to be basically a disc uh, disc driveless Xbox One X with the newer architecture, and I think they're going to hit the two ninety nine price with it. And Whoa! Then just, what? Yeah. Whoa! The <laughs> Xbox two ninety nine. Yeah. That's wow. what I think that they're going to, they were selling the Xbox. Um, God, it's all confusing in my head. The one X <laughs> there was like on the Microsoft store, they were selling that for like $199 for a couple days and right. they were gone like instantly. So if they, I think they're aiming for a 299, cause if they can hit a 299, they're going to own the holiday and you know, everything, everybody who buys a series X is just going to be a bonus for them. Cause you know, I, mom and pop go into the GameStop if they still have one in their town and they say, get me the hot new console. My kids want, and they say it's $300 and they say, that's the one I want. Bring it up, wrap it up. I'm taking it home. But but here's the thing, though. I mean, I I, I think that I think a lot of that's interesting, and it's definitely up for debate. But you 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 did say that you think this could be disc driveless, or thank you for saying that. So it keeps me from saying discless, which is <laughs> <laughs> very difficult. Um, <laughs> I think that would be a really interesting decision, and I don't think it would be a good one because I think a lot of people that would want the cheaper entry point priced console would be the same ones that would want to basically save a few bucks on used games here and there, trade games with their friends. The digital digital storefronts uh, are a luxury for A, people with better internet, and B, people who are okay with dropping 60 bucks on something that they will never see any money return on. Um, if they pack uh, Xbox Game Pass Ultimate, like a year subscription in here, and be like, hey, you get a free year of like all the digital games, just you get them all, then that's it, you know? But people also do use these a lot as Blu-ray players. Like yeah. that was the whole thing about, um, I mean, the PS2 was such a, in part such a success because it was a cheap DVD player. Yep. Um, and yes. so getting a cheap 4K Blu-ray player, uh, if you're already planning on buying a console, 
I, I wouldn't be shocked. I mean, honestly, there may be several tiers. Like we may be looking at a Series S with a uh, Series S with a disc drive, a Series X with a disc drive, and a Series X without a disc drive. Who knows? Yep. All I all I know is they're not going to use any uh, lettering that will cause the same uh, kerfuffle as the Xbox One Sad Edition because that was yeah. just too funny uh, to not harp on. So th- they'll avoid that in the naming convention. But otherwise, yeah. I, I I wouldn't be shocked if they, uh, you know, have as many tiers as they want or feel is necessary to sell. Yeah. And, you know, with like the global pandemic, you won't even have a GameStop employee to befuddle with your weird questions, <laughs> <about> <laughs> which one you need to get your son or whatever, because you and your wife are fighting. I think um, the so as a callback, I think yeah. uh, what you should like, I, I hadn't really considered the idea of at launch, there being two SKUs and then two additional SKUs that are disc free disc list, because <laughs> um, that, that puts it in, in an interesting perspective in terms of being able to basically, you know, personalize which which point you want to get into. Like I was telling, talking to Jonathan earlier, but I'm going to get the the disc version of the PlayStation Five, even though I'm almost entirely digital, because at the off chance that like one of my friends wants to lend me a game, or you know, there's there's a copy of Game at Work or something like that, I want to have the option open. Um, whether or not I'll use it doesn't really matter as much as knowing that it's always potentially there. Um, and I don't, I don't want to sort of like pay while, pay while myself or shoehorn myself into a corner where I don't have that option ever again. But I do think it's going to be really interesting if they come in with something like a two ninety nine or even like you know three forty nine price point, and Sony comes in at you know four ninety nine, mm-hmm. um, then they've aggressively undercut the competition, and that looks really good in like a full page Black Friday ad, and that's really what it's all about for sure. Oh yeah. Uh, in our in our article on this new story, uh, some of the commenters were uh, expressing frustration with this new model for breaking, you know, providing multiple different versions of one console uh, as opposed to just having a GameCube. There's just one Nintendo GameCube. If you're buying a GameCube, you're buying the same thing that everyone else got. Yeah. There's no no different price models because uh, they they feel like it's it sort of confuses everything, makes it more like PC gaming or the smartphone business where it just sort of gives you too much to think about and it, it takes away the simplicity of console gaming. Do you agree? Do you, do you feel the same way with any of that, Brian? Oh yeah, no, completely. I, I was actually just thinking about that earlier. Um, you know, in regards to PC gaming and even, I mean, to, to simplify it, let's go with smartphones, right? Um, I, I always get, I always get like the, the largest, stupidest, most powerful smartphone. Um, <laughs> and my wife always gets the one that has the least amount of bells and whistles because she basically uses hers as a web browser, occasionally a camera, and then she talks to people, you know, like FaceTime and texting and stuff like that. But me, when it comes around, I'm like, oh, I might, I might, you know, if like they drop like a brand new, like, significant video game on this thing. I want to be able to play it in all its glory. I want to use it for video editing and photography and all this other stuff. Um, Consoles are different because they have less function across the board. And so when you're sort of paring down your list of the bells and whistles that you really want to pay for at the end of the day, um, you you have less of that. Like I'm not going to buy the better Xbox because I'm going to be doing serious video editing on it or anything like that. And so you're really just saying, do I want something that's slightly less powerful or less storage? We don't exactly know where they're going to move those goalposts on this, but I do think it 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 becomes sort of harder to calculate exactly what you're buying into and what you're saving. And in terms of gaming PCs, that's pretty knowledgeable. You can't run something at max settings when you don't buy the best PC on, on the market or something that's capable of running things at max. I think most people understand that, but it would be sort of weird to buy into a next gen console and then just play stuff at mid settings until the end of the generation, you know, like that just, that feels like kind of missing the point. Yeah. So I'm, I'm interesting. And I, I wonder how you, how you sell that. Like you and you know, all of us can have this conversation here cause we're kind of in the know, but what is a commercial for Lockhart or series S look like? Play it's your favorite games, price. but not as good. Yeah, just the yeah, price. It's, the it, screen. It's, I mean, <laughs> it's the prices and it's pay, play at the tier you want because they'll I, theoretically everything will probably support 4K to some extent. So yep. they will say everything has 4K and then it really will just come down to price, 
disk drive or not and uh, hard drive space. And those will be the things that they communicate to you. And like with buying a phone, they'll keep it at that top level stuff for the advertising. And then if you want to dig in, you know, they'll have the website that tells you comparing the models and all of that stuff. But I think like for the average consumer who maybe sees it in a Black Friday ad or, you know, on a TV ad, they'll see, oh, $299, $399, whatever it is, and be like, oh, yeah, I'll buy that one. Sure. Yep. Yeah. Well, we'll see if we learn more about the Xbox Lockhart or Series S in August. Uh, The next big uh, beat for Xbox 2020 is in July, where they're going to have a a showcase of first-party games. So lots of exciting stuff coming up in the not-too-distant future. Now we can talk about Nintendo, uh, although it's uh, not terribly... Happy news. The uh, opening of the imminent opening of the Super Nintendo World theme park uh, in Universal Studios Japan has been delayed indefinitely due to the ongoing pandemic. And apparently the, 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 the park is like pretty much complete. It could have opened up in July, but they've decided to postpone that indefinitely. Uh, Brian, you're like probably the biggest Nintendo fan here. Uh, what, and even though this is in Japan, mm-hmm. like, were you excited about this, the first Nintendo like theme park opening? Oh yeah, no, totally. I'm not even like a huge theme park guy, but I went, I've been to Tokyo Disney sea more times than I've been to Disneyland and Disneyland is an hour flight from me. <laughs> and Disney sea is on the other side of the universe. Um, Cause uh, there's a thing that happens in, to be completely blunt in Japanese theme parks that are different in American theme parks, which is cleanliness. <laughs> like there's, yeah. they're organized and they're sparse and they're clean and um, people are polite and they're waiting in line without, you know, like spilling beer out of a fanny pack or whatever. <laughs> there's a lot, there's a lot that happens there. So I was super excited for this. This is act absolutely something that I would have like fought tooth and nail to cover from IGN. And if not yeah. had that failed, paid out of my own pocket to go visit. Um, because I think that would have been an absolute blast. That said, um, watching all the leaked photos from this thing come out during this year of all years made it basically impossible to be excited for. Like there are there mm. are movies I want to see that I won't even go see, um, let alone getting on a nine and a half hour flight to go to a theme park yeah. crowded with people. Like it just doesn't. Like the timing is so bad because we this is the kind of thing Nintendo fans have been waiting their entire life for, and they'll have to keep waiting for. Because we're just not ready yet. At least America isn't. Japan is seeing a, a resurgence uh, uh, of positive cases too. Um, yeah, I don't know when. Like when, Seth, do you take your kids to like in, before before the uh, pandemic times? Do you, do you take your family? Times. Yeah, did you take your family to <laughs> theme parks? Is that a thing you guys oh, do? Oh yeah. Okay. Fun Town Splashdown USA Maine's premier. Uh, theme it's called park. Fun Town Splashdown. It's actually two parks. Two parks. They, okay. It used to be oh, Fun Town, okay. and then okay. across the street was Splashtown, and they were at war for mm. decades. Now, eventually, I a, they I came a, a peace agreement. Is it is it possible to have fun in Splashtown, and is it possible to get splash in Fun Town? <laughs> no. No, 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 no. It's strictly divided. Yeah. Interesting. They'll actually get thrown out. If they see you having fun in Splashdown, get out of here. I thought it was <laughs> like, a the po- place Pokemon, like a Pokemon Sword and Shield thing where there is significant crossover, but this is good to know in case I'm ever in Maine <laughs> again for yeah. a theme park. <laughs> you want to go to a theme park where half the people are drunk? Yes, more than ever. I don't um, remember yeah. where I was going with it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if we're looking at a commercial for the uh, theme park or not. Um, so, oh and- yeah, they did like a music video. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, there's <laughs> there's also going to be a Super Nintendo World opening at uh, Universal Studios Orlando, supposedly in 2023. Uh, it, so, assuming things are a little more back to normal by then, like Brian, would you want to make the the pilgrimage to Orlando to go to yeah. Super Nintendo World? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, this is a weird year to be like, I'm excited to see what Florida does next. <laughs> <laughs> yes, hypothetically, absolutely. I want I want the world to be a better place again. I want things to go back to normal uh, in, in a healthy, safe, and regulated measure. Uh, and I want to go on the Super Mario rides. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. Like, yeah, this is, this is all. I also like, like from like a, so I went to, I went to, um, galaxy's edge last year as somebody who was like totally 
kind of sour grapes about the whole thing because like literally everybody i knew on earth had gone to that theme park before i did and i was like oh whatever it's probably kind of dorky you know any of you i don't even like star wars anymore it sucks whatever man and i got there and i was like oh my god and i walked in through like the little entrance and they're they're playing this music and like an r2 unit rolled by and i, I just started tearing up and i went in the gift shops and i bought a a salacious crumb who's a Kowakian <laughs> lizard monkey puppet and it screams and talks and my kid's terrified of it. And I bought um, cool. the the Ewok Endor Tiki mug from the bar. Like there's so much, that's like, that's like, I, I want to fill, I want to fill my suitcases with <laughs> junk that's exclusive to this park. I, yeah. The rides are like, that's interesting, but I want to get all the cool like souvenir garbage. And um, I don't know. I hope, I hope there's a way to do that in the meantime. Like I, like, I, I really hope they figure out, I hope every theme park right now is looking at this situation and instead of just going, uh, hey, uh, the hell with science, let's reopen. They go, let's <laughs> let's open an online shop. Let's let's create like uh, let's let's put virtual ride tours on YouTube like or on VR, yeah. um, wh whatever it is. I, I would love to experience some part of this as sort of like a little appetizer before the actual thing opens up, which probably won't be happening for a long time. So yeah, I hope there's a yeah. sort of like a make good. Uh, before we bounce off Nintendo, Brian, did you get one of these? Yes, you got one too. Yeah, it's the, amazing. Yes, that it's is so cool. Honestly, uh, one of my favorite things on earth. Uh, yeah, F Philip Summers, who's a friend of IGN, um, oh. made. Uh, he's been doing these things over at HandDrawnGameGuides.com, uh, where he has drawn from hand, uh, from scratch. Uh, physical player's guides for Contra, Ninja Gaiden, and now the original Legend oh, of Zelda. Wow. Um, they are gorgeous. Uh, they are basically sort of evocative of a lot of the conceptual and promotional artwork that um, uh, was made for Link to the Past, Link's Awakening back in the day. Um, and oh, also, I, I would say mixed with like the maps that you see that, that, that kids made, you know, or you would read in Nintendo Powers back in the day. Yeah. Um, so he, they're extremely limited run. They sold out in seconds this morning. No! But you can buy the P. Yeah. You, they you only made a hundred of them. He, he yeah. made a hundred no! of them. Yeah. And Make so 101. You, <laughs> I, I think, I think I, we, I will continue to nudge him to make more, but in the meantime, yeah. uh, you can get a set of all three of these in PDF form for two bucks. Yeah. And then download them, print them yourself if you want. But at the very least, you can have incredibly high res uh, scans to look at on your computer. I, I got all three this morning, and oh, yeah, and it, it also he drew the map. Out. Come on, yeah. yeah, he drew the map. Oh, yeah, honestly, one so of my cool. favorite, like one of my favorite things ever. Even um, the uh, envelope that came in was like a, a gold foil, just super super cool. I put a bunch of uh, pictures on my Twitter too, if you want to go check those out. But yeah, handdrawngameguides.com. Uh, yep. Follow Phil Summers, amazing artist, super smart dude. Um, just a really, just a guy that really gets video games and and especially old school games and, and why we love them and, and and play them. So honestly, like I replay the original Legend of uh, Legend of Zelda probably once a year, and so usually I have so much of that committed to memory, but usually i'll pull up uh some like online resources and have like a map saved on my phone i'm going to do like a complete uh physical strategy guide hand-drawn version run of this game uh, very soon where i'll play it from scratch yeah totally and just have all the maps right there in case i get lost or stuck like super excited for that yeah it's awesome uh okay before we go today seth what if yes. i were to tell you there could very soon be a new battle royale game for you to play from ubisoft wow uh, uh -huh. i'm listening you know i do like me some PUBG. i know you i know PUBG is your game that's what you play instead of the last of us part two instead uh, of a lot of games <laughs> i played PUBG. unfortunately this is a i guess it's soft announced now jonathan is that accurate because there's a website yeah, that's fair. There was like a teaser website and then a bunch of streamers said, hey, we played this game and it's going to go up July 2nd, but there wasn't really like a... I, at least I haven't gotten a press release yet, which is not normal yeah. for new Ubisoft game releases. <laughs> yeah. Um, so It's apparently... It's a, a battle royale from Ubisoft called Hyperscape. And uh, there is a, a website that went live earlier today for... Uh, a, like, it's, like a, it's like a fake company website. So it's some viral marketing. The company's called Prisma Dimensions. Somewhere down the text, they make mention of this 
reality TV show game that you're playing called Hyperscape. And then it says uh, the full reveal is coming this hmm. Thursday, July 2nd. They so, should have running just man called vibes. it. They should have called it Abstergo and just put it in the Assassin's yeah. Creed universe. <laughs> oh. I mean, I, see, you shouldn't have to do their jobs for them, John. <laughs> I know. Right. <laughs> It's just so funny because like they they've done this with Abstergo Industries websites before. Like they've created a lot of fake uh, websites for that business that doesn't exist. And I'm like, well, you already did the legwork there. Just say this is a ra- reality TV show in the era of Assassin's Creed modern day, and you've got yourself a game. Yeah. So I don't know, uh, Seth. We've got you got PUBG, you got Fortnite, you got Apex yep. Legends. Is, oh, there yeah. ro- is there room for another battle royale game? Uh, a year ago, yeah, I would have said so. Now uh, I think pretty people are pretty cool. Oh, yeah, there's Warzone too. Yeah. Well, yeah, Warzone's actually really mm-hmm. good, but uh, I I don't think I don't think the battle royale has the uh, the sort of draw that it did a year, even a year ago. Mm-hmm. Two years ago would have been the perfect time. Mm-hmm. People were hungry for that yeah. for that Fortnite well. <laughs> experience that wasn't Fortnite. I mean, you you mentioned Apex Legends. I think that like they there's a tremendous missed opportunity to not do this sort of um, uh, kind of hype rollout that that game had. Like that game went from being like, "Ooh, what is this?" to a hundred streamers in unison and press were all going, "We played it. It's real. It kicks ass, and it's available right now." Exactly. And like that's that's a, you that capitalized on a moment. It seized an entire industry early in the year. Uh, full of people who were looking for something new and interesting and free. And they all jumped on it and it became incredibly popular. Uh, It mixed like really fun gameplay with like really awesome characters and art design and people were hooked. And, you know, like every time any of the like sort of microtransaction stuff around it felt gross and nefarious, people spoke up and uh respawn pulled back and addressed it and fixed it it's a you have to treat those things as this kind of living breathing growing thing um i think they did a really good job of maintaining that um and i think what should have happened here is that we we shouldn't like we shouldn't be you know theorizing about what this is uh right now like we should Mm -hmm. be playing it like this this was their opportunity to go people are paying attention right now here it is and Mm -hmm. i i don't think that that rollout was there uh just yet well they forgot the one crucial element that Apex Legends had was uh, dump trucks of money at streamers' houses that were just pouring hundred dollar bills just right into their bank accounts. That is true. That is true. Um, but I do, I do think it's important that we get uh, accused of getting paid to do reviews. <laughs> <laughs> so Ubisoft does have its own uh, sort of uh, E3 style conference coming up on july 12th and apparently this game will go live then on july 12th but i agree with what brian was saying it would have been a little bit more impactful if uh, it had been like a surprise and it's available now sort of situation uh, i guess we'll sort of have to wait to see more we don't know any beyond this being a battle royale seeming to have some kind of sci-fi setting we don't really know anything about it but at least ubisoft has shown that they're dedicated to uh sticking with their these long Tail games, these games of the surface from the division to uh, wait, what's the melee combat one? For honor, oh, uh, for, for honor. honor, for for honor, uh, Rainbow Six Siege, of course. Uh, these are all games that they've been supporting for a really long time. But then there's Skull and Bones. Does anyone remember Skull and Bones? I played it. Oh, oh I do. Yeah, yeah. When no, it, I I, I played a, it at E3. At some bygone oh, yeah. E3. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I I straight up played it. I was I was very bad at it. Um, and I did not like it. But uh, th- so there, there are people that like big the big boats bumping into each other. So this um, <laughs> big boat like bumping. See, yeah, I would like to see it come out at some point. Uh, it's definitely not yeah. for me. It it felt like like a large, slow for honor with boats. But <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I would say in the meantime, just play all the boat stuff and literally all the last seven Assassin's Creed games instead. Yeah, because it's exactly the same. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know if. Skull and Bones is ever coming out. It was going to be an all multiplayer pirates game. And then last year at E3, Ubisoft announced Roller Champions, which is their free to play roller derby game. And that yeah, still isn't yeah. out. Uh, mm-hmm. I actually think that they, the latest like sort of blog update on that said they're taking it out of alpha and just working on it some more. So I, I don't know about that one either. Um, and then also uh, Call of Duty Warzone. Seth, have you played Warzone? 
I I have it installed on my computer, all 190 gigabytes or whatever, yeah. and then I all my friends stopped playing it, <laughs> so I have not played it. Well, you could play it with your kids, right? That's actually true, except for they would have no interest. They don't want to play old man games with their with their pops. <laughs> gotcha. It is uh, it is cool worth mentioning games. that we're like what two weeks away from Ubisoft's E3 shaped yeah. announcement press yeah, conference 12. reveal film um, official title. That's what and it's called. Yeah, we mm-hmm. yeah we we could potentially find poor cool. guy in the helicopter. Plane. <laughs> um, we could potentially find out more about Skull and Bones and and the roller game then. <laughs> so we'll see. Potentially. <laughs> Potentially, we could find out more about Beyond Good and Evil Two. Oh yeah, that that uh that that tech demo vaporware that like was I or think just, over over scoped just, beyond belief. <laughs> we're just about out of time. I wanted to get Seth's comment on one thing. Warzone is getting a new mode, a two hundred player battle royale. That sounds actually really awesome. You think I was? You think that sounds good? That's not too many. No. no okay. No, no, no. I wish there were more people. More. There was a, th- a thousand. Two thousand. Two thousand people. <laughs> two thousand people. Yes. In a single battle royale. That takes do you guys seven remember? Hours. Do you remember Mag? Mag action. Yeah. Massive action oh, game. Oh yeah. That was not. That was not two fifty. I think it was two fifty six. Yeah. I don't know why they came up with that number. <laughs> <laughs> but it was like two hundred fifty six people. Yeah. Um, I forget the name. Zipper Interactive, the name of the yes. developer, no longer in business. Wow. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that about brings us to the end of another uh, News Games and More. Like I said at the top of the show, uh, no show for us tomorrow because instead we're going to be airing the uh, awards for IGN Summer of Gaming, followed by the after party with a very special guest. So uh, please tune into that. Thank you to Jonathan, R- uh, Brian, and Seth for hanging out with me this afternoon. Everybody have a good evening, and we'll see you all very soon. <laughs>